All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm joined on the phone by Mohammed Sahimi. He's a professor of, I forget, chemical chemistry something at uh, USC. And uh, writes for us at antiwar.com. You can also find his writings other places on the web. Uh, welcome back to the show, Mohammed. How are you doing, sir? Uh, it's good to be back in your program, Scott. Ah, well, thank you. I'm very happy to have you here. Uh, one of my favorite critics of America's Iran policy, you are, as you well know, and uh, and focused on all the parts that I think are the most important, too. And so right now I want to start this conversation, at least, Mohammed, with a discussion about the sub-state terrorist group, private army, whatever it is, I don't know, uh, Jandala. Now, I want to preface one thing here, which is that uh, this is really a correction uh, for the audience. I have said numerous times on this show going back over the last few years that uh, Jandala that America is backing against the Iranians is the same Jandala that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed used to be the head of it. And yet I interviewed a reporter from the Asia Times who said that that was not correct. And that, uh, oh man, what was that guy's name? I'm sorry, I forget the name of the Asia Times reporter. But he said that, no, there are two different groups uh, that are Jandala. And one of them is the one that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed used to be the boss of. But the one that America supports to kill Iranians is a separate group altogether. So that's a correction for what it's worth, assuming he's right. But um, I'll just let you take it from there. What do we know about John Dalla? Well, let me first say, you probably talked to Pepe Escobar from Asia Times? Oh, uh, no. I Well, I have talked to Pepe uh, numerous times, but that's not who I'm thinking of. He's a Pakistani gentleman. Uh, in fact, you know what? Go ahead, and, and I'll look up his name. I have it on my list here somewhere. Okay, but, but what I wanted to say that uh, is that it is actually true that there are two Jandala. One is uh, uh, the one that operates in Iran, uh, but uses Pakistan, which is on Iran's border in southeastern Iran, as its base to attack uh, Iranian security forces within the province of Sistan and Baluchistan. And the other one is associated with... Uh, radical Islamic groups in Pakistan and, and probably uh, Afghanistan. So there are two of them. But the one that is in Iran uh, is supported and funded by uh, Saudi Arabia and also uh, most likely by the United States. Back in 2007, when Dick Cheney traveled to Pakistan uh, to talk to Pakistani leaders, one of the subjects that was brought up was the support of the CIA and the United States for Jundallah and its terrorist operation within Iranian territory. And after he came back to the United States, instead of referring to them as uh, a terrorist group, which is what they are, um, he referred to them as guerrilla to uh, give them some sort of legitimacy, uh, you know, aligning with the uh, liberation movement, for example. But John Dalla is, 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 has a, about uh, 1,200 hardcore members, and they are... Uh, uh, funded, as I said, by Saudi Arabia, and has killed a large number of Iranian policemen and security forces, and in addition, a large number of civilians in, in Sistan and Baluchistan uh, province of Iran. And let me, let me also mention this, because some of your uh, listeners may, may know about this. There is no question that the central government in Iran, not just the present central government, but for decades, um, uh, has had uh, some discrimination uh, uh, against some ethnic minorities in Iran. But these are all problems that have existed in Iran for decades, and compared to many other countries, they are relatively minor. Uh, but what the CIA and Saudi Arabia and other countries that are opposed to Iran have done is uh, taking advantage of this uh, uh, discontent among some ethnic minorities in Iran uh, in order to try to stir up uh, uh, you know, uh, chaos and uh, dissent in Iran and, and to destabilize the country uh, in order to advance the, their agenda. And John Dalla is a perfect example of it. Um, as I said, it has killed a large number of civilians. It has, uh, it, in one case, it just kidnapped a large number of policemen and took them to the other side of the border with Pakistan and killed a large number of them. In fact, it, uh, it beheaded a large number of them. And then in several other cases, uh, several very large explosions took place 
uh, in the province of Sistan and Baluchistan, which not only killed security forces, but also large, killed a large number of civilians. The central government has actually realized that it has to uh, to start a program of reconstructions and, and, and improving the lives of ordinary people there. And one of the explosions happened just when uh, the, a representative of the central government was in the uh, provincial capital of Sistan Baluchistan, in Zahedan, talking to local leaders about how to uh, start the reconstruction and aid program in order to uh, improve the lives of ordinary people when the explosion took place and not only killed him, but it also killed a large number of local people uh, that were talking to the representative of the central government. So that's the... Uh, that's what we have in Sistan Baluchistan. And in fact, and, and of course, as, as is well known, its leader was captured by the Iranian government, although the circumstances of his arrest is not clear, and he was executed recently uh, in Iran for all the terrorist uh, operations that he had led. Okay, now, there's a bunch of things to try to go over there. Uh, first of all, uh, the name of the reporter I was trying to think of uh, is Syed Salim Shazad. Okay. Um, from the Asia Times, who, who originally set me straight on there. So that's that footnote taken care of there. Um, and then, so actually, that's, let's stay on footnotes for a minute here. Um, you know, you've described kind of what madmen these guys are, you know, abducting and, and murdering people and blowing up mosques and, and creating all this havoc all over the place. But how is it that uh, you're under the impression that the CIA and or the Joint Special Operations Command or any other part of the American government are working with these guys, Mohammed? Well, first of all, there is no, uh, there is no way uh, for a small group like Jundala uh, to be able to carry out such large operations uh, that kills a large number of people each time they uh, carry out such an operation within Iranian territory without having any foreign support. Uh, that's, that's the first fact. Secondly, uh, the Jondala and, and in, in more generally the Baluch who live in both in Iran and Pakistan are Sunni Muslims, not Shiites, and, and some of them are in fact uh, um, belong to the uh, Salafi uh, branch of Sunni Islam, which is basically what uh, Saudi Arabia uh, advocates in the Islamic world. Uh, third, Saudi Arabia uh, has long uh, been opposed to Iranian government, not just during the Islamic Republic, but also during the Shah of Iran before the Iranian Revolution of 1979, except that at that time the Shah was an ally of the West, and therefore the differences and the opposition within the Saudi royal family against Iran was under the surface. Um, in addition, I organized... Uh, I co-organized a symposium on Iran relationship at the University of Southern California in October of 2008, in which we had uh, Robert Baer, the, Baer, the former CIA agent who was uh, operative in the Middle East for 25 years. And during his talk and the exchange that he had with the audience, he specifically mentioned that uh, the CIA probably uh, provides support for John Dalla. And he said that should not be any surprise because uh, Iran, for example, provides support to Hezbollah in Lebanon, and the United States retaliates by uh, providing support to groups like Jundala. And Jundala is not the only group that operates within Iran and carry out terrorist operations, uh, but there are other groups in the Kurdish area that we can talk about uh, after the break. Okay, great. That is uh, Mohammed Sahimi we're talking with. Uh, on the phone here, everybody, Anti-War Radio. He's a professor of chemical engineering at USC and uh, writes for PBS.org as well as Antiwar.com. We'll be right back after this. You can watch the LRN Studio Cam and chat with other listeners anytime at cam.lrn.fm. That's cam.lrn.fm. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. All right, y'all, it's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Orton, and on the line I have Mohammed Sahimi. You can find his articles at original.antiwar.com slash Sahimi. Spelled just like it sounds. 
He's a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Southern California here in L.A. And the article I'm looking at right now is from last October, the 21st, 2009, Jundala and the Geopolitics of Energy. And one thing that this article does, Mohammed, is it really goes through and lists all the footnotes. Now, you just said you heard from Robert Baer, the former CIA agent, in person, that he told you at a symposium you held at USC. But I wanted to also go ahead and mention for people so that they know that uh, there are real sources of information from this when they hear crazy, impossible things like America supporting Salafi suicide bomber types. Uh, Andrew Coburn broke the story of the Democrats spending the money on this in Counterpunch last spring. And then he was followed up quickly by Seymour Hirsch, and then the Telegraph in England, and then Brian Ross at ABC News, who is not a credible reporter at all, but because, in fact, he's so close to the intelligence community. And when he comes out with something like this that makes them look pretty bad, it makes me think, well, maybe it is true. Uh, of course, if he's saying something like, ooh, Saddam Hussein did the anthrax attack, everybody double-check his work. Uh, Brian Ross, I don't want to give him too much credit, but he's, you know, another in this giant pile of footnotes that says that America's supporting, uh, you know, basically Al Qaeda of Iran. Ain't yes, that and right? I, and I, yes, and I, I, as you mentioned, I listed all that information in the uh, in the October 2009 article, but I just wanted to mention that uh, that not only all those. Uh, credible uh, sources exist, but I also heard it personally from Robert Barr, the former CIA agent. One point that I would like to point out is that although John Dalla claims that it supports the rights of the Baluch minorities in Iran and does whatever it does on their behalf, it actually does not enjoy any significant support uh, within the Baluch community in Iran. Uh, in fact, when their leader, uh, Rigi, was captured by the Iranian government, from the information that I gathered and the conversations that I had with several people, uh, I understood that the uh, Baluchi people in, in, in Iran province of Sistan and Baluchistan were actually relieved that he had been captured because they thought that that would put an end to the terrorist operations that uh, his group was carrying out in, in Iran, uh, province of Sistan, Baluchistan. But I, I, I should mention that although he was captured, but we recently had another big explosion uh, in that part of Iran, uh, it, uh, which killed, uh, uh, again, several civilians. So uh, the operations have continued, although the, the, the leader, Rigi, was captured and, and executed by Iranian government. But it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, enjoy the support that he claims to have, and in fact, there are some uh, conservative and, and uh, neoconservative publications in the West that make such, such claims that John Dalla actually sup enjoys wide support among Iranian uh, uh, Baluchi minority, but he doesn't. It, 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 it is uh, pure and simple. It's a terrorist organization supported by uh, the West and in addition to uh, to West by Saudi Arabia and other Sunni countries, probably uh, in, in, in the Persian Gulf, who well, are Mohammed, opposed to Iran government. Uh, you know, uh, Seymour Hirsch, after he wrote his article, I think it was Preparing the Battlefield, was his article where he talked about Jandala. And he did a, a press conference, or a, not a press conference, but, you know, a symposium at a university or something where he was up on the stage and he kind of waxed philosophical about this for a little while. And he talked about how, well, Here's how Americans can understand this. Reverse the roles and pretend for a minute that the Iranians were looking at America and said, oh, okay, well, here's how to break up America. We'll put our support behind, you know, this weird sect of Christian identity neo-Nazis, you know, like the kind of guy, uh, Eric Rudolph, that did the Olympic Park bombing and the abortion clinic bombings. Or something. We'll, we'll support those guys, which there's only, you know, 10 of, and which the other 300 million of us hate and have no tolerance for whatsoever. But the Iranians... You know, basically the example being it would be really dumb of them to try to do that, right? The the League to Restore the Confederate Flag or whatever. That is a marginal group anyway and, in fact, is the most patriotic group of American nationalists that you could find, right? would be working class southern white guys who still like the Confederate flag. They're not going to betray America for a foreign country in a million years, no matter what their internal dissent problem is. 
the idea of a foreign country coming and supporting, you know, the the Confederate Flag Association or whatever, it's just laughable and ridiculous. And that's basically what the United States is doing in Iran, is backing the most marginal groups to cause trouble. But what good could it do other than maybe, you know, empowering the hardliners in the government? Oh, exactly. And maybe I mean, that's the purpose. Exactly. I think uh, that's... Uh, one of the purposes, in, I mean, in addition to supporting these terrorist groups, uh, imposing sanctions and make threats of military attacks in Iran, what people don't realize, uh, or, or at least some people don't realize in the West, is that the only thing that these things do, uh, these things do, like imposing sanctions, supporting terrorist groups, and uh, uh, threatening Iran with military strikes, is to make the hardliners in Iran uh, to be in a much tighter control, because they can justify. And if we put ourselves in their position, we can probably uh, understand why they do it. They can justify whatever they do under the guise of threat to national security and territorial integrity of Iran. And let's face it, that, that is a, a justifiable excuse, because after all, a, a point of uh, supporting terrorist groups groups that operate within Iran, like in Sistan, Baluchistan, by Jundala, or some Kurdish group in, in Kurdistan, is to uh, basically try to break up Iran, or at the very least to destabilize the central government uh, so that it would be uh, in a much weaker position, and so that uh, that hopefully will lead to their downfall, uh, the way the West looks at it. So the what uh, Seymour Hersh talks about is a perfect analogy. Uh, they support groups in Iran that have no uh, broad support, they are totally marginal, and they give them guns, they give them funds, they train them in order for them to carry out terrorist operations within Iranian territory. Now, let me again emphasize, what I say is not in, in support of a, a, a guy like Ahmadinejad, whom I oppose, but rather is in the framework of non-intervention in the internal affairs of another country, and being an anti-war activist and a peace activist that don't want to see any new war in, in, in the Middle East, particularly against my native land, Iran, where I come from. So right this on. is not in support yeah. of Ahmadinejad, but in support of peace and in support of being an, 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 anti, an anti-war activist that, that I am. Right. And, yeah, people should understand that, and it's... It's actually a shame that we even have to make that clear that you're not some representative of the regime. You're part of the expat community here that lives in Los Angeles, uh, which is, I think, 99% against the Ayatollah regime there, uh, you know, and, of course, including you. But now, so here's the thing, too, you know, as long as we're on that point, Mom, it seems to me like the real bottom line here is that it doesn't have to be this way at all, that the entire, never even mind the Clinton era of the dual containment policy and all this insanity, back when Dick Cheney used to complain about the sanctions uh, before he uh, was the vice president. Uh, back when he was running Halliburton, but even just the 21st century, even just post-September 11th days, everybody knows Flint Leverett's been on this show. We've talked about this for years and years. Everybody knows the Iranians and the Americans were getting along famously, at least with the State Department. Um, after September 11th, there was a, a million people turned out to do a candlelight vigil in downtown Tehran after September 11th, and we could have had a complete reset of American relations, no hard feelings, let's work this out. The same thing even with Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein had proven himself to be a loyal puppet 99% of the time. They could have said to him, look, you know, you're not a jihadist type, and they're the ones that we're mad at now, and so as long as you promise to keep al-Qaeda out of your country and, you know, be a good little dictator, we'll let you stay the dictator, he would have taken them up on that. And the, we could be friends. We could have the absolute reverse of the dual containment. We could have the America friends with everybody policy in the Middle East right now. And our only enemies would be, what, a dozen friends of Osama and Zawahiri still hiding out in the mountains of Pakistan somewhere, if they even exist anymore at all. Yes, I mean, in addition to what you said, and Iran did play a very important role when uh, um, the Taliban regime was overthrown in, in Kabul, Afghanistan, in April 2003, right after the United States invaded Iraq, uh, the Khatami administration, the administration of a, a really good, moderate uh, Iranian president, Mohammad Khatami, uh, presented a comprehensive proposal to the United States uh, in which 
it talks about putting all the issues on the table and uh, negotiating them so that the differences uh, between Iran and the United States can be addressed uh, by diplomatic means through peaceful negotiations after several decades of hostility. Iran has offered to uh, put significant restrictions uh, on top of what it already has on its nuclear program. Iran has uh, um, uh, proposed that it would help Hezbollah in Lebanon to uh, put down its arm and become a completely political organization. And Iran has uh, offered uh, help in several other aspects, including Iraq, Afghanistan, and, 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 and other places where Iran has a very significant influence. But the Bush administration, that was the time that uh, George W. Bush had just landed on that uh, aircraft carrier and had declared a mission accomplished. So they thought that they could do the same thing with Iran. So they rejected the proposal without even studying it uh, uh, carefully to see what Iran had, uh, had, uh, uh, had proposed. And when that was uh, rejected by the United States, the hardliners in Tehran uh, became a stronger, and the position of moderates and uh, reformists in Iran became weaker because, after all, the moderates had made this very comprehensive proposal uh, in which they were trying to address all the issues that are supposedly important to the United States, and the United States had rejected any negotiations. So invasion of Iraq and rejection of Iran's uh, uh, comprehensive proposal did wonders for hardliners in Tehran, and in fact, that was the beginning of the end for reformists being part of the government and part of the power hierarchy in Iran and put uh, hardliners. Um, yeah, well, I got I got another one to add to that, which is July 2005. George Bush actually came out on TV, and his administration had been doing this for two or three days, and then Bush himself went on TV and said, hey, people of Iran, you better not elect a conservative. You better not vote right wing if you want to get along with us. And the people of Iran all went and voted. It was the biggest turnout for Ahmadinejad they could have ever hoped for. And his people actually gave statements to the world press. It was in the BBC and elsewhere that where they were literally quoted laughing, like parentheses laughter as Ahmadinejad's people say thank you George Bush for your get out the vote for Ahmadinejad campaign that you did the other day wonderful oh absolutely and, and in fact George Bush because of what George Bush said and because of the a strong sense of nationalism uh, in Iran because Iran is, 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 is a uh, very old nation has existed for thousands of years so sense of nationalism in Iran is extremely strong uh, and although, uh, let's say, the majority, the large majority of Iran do not like the conservatives and hardliners in Tehran, but when it comes to intervention of another country, particularly the United States, that has a long history of intervening in Iran's internal affairs from the 1953 coup all the way to the present time, of course they would react the way that uh, they did in 2005 when they voted for Ahmadinejad uh, and uh, elected him president. Now, the interesting thing about it is that Bush was telling people not to vote and, and also was saying that the Iranian president uh, has no power, has no legitimacy and no power. But right after Ahmadinejad was elected president, they turned around and started making him the most powerful man in Iran, uh, which he wasn't at least at that time in Iran because uh, the country wasn't in the uh, situation that it is today. In but other words, when, when there was a moderate face on the presidency, Katami, a guy who I don't really know all that much about, but was seemingly reasonable, quote-unquote, for the, the Americans to work with, they would marginalize him and say, no, it's all about the evil Ayatollah. But then when Ahmadinejad became the president, then... Eh, the Ayatollah actually looks kind of moderate and reasonable compared to this guy. So now they decide in the media we're talking about to just mar marginalize the role of the Ayatollah, uh, Khamenei, and focus on Ahmadinejad, who has a big mouth. Uh, precisely. I mean, Khatami, uh, you said you don't know much about him, but let me tell you, he's a, uh, he's, he's a good man. He has never been involved in any case of crime or corruption. He's... Uh, highly respected in Iran, and he's now uh, one of the leaders of the opposition green movement in Iran. And he did want to have a dialogue with the United States. He proposed dialogue of 
civilization. Uh, he wanted to improve the relationship with the United States. And as I said, he, his administration made a comprehensive proposal in, the, in April of 2003 in order to address by diplomatic negotiations all the issues of concern to the United States and, of course, in Iran. I mean, Iran also has uh, several legitimate grievances against this country. It's not just uh, – I mean, we should not forget that just because a guy like Ahmadinejad is in poverty in Iran does not mean that Iranians and the Iranian nation uh, do not have legitimate uh, grievances against the United States. They do. Uh, this country has imposed sanctions against Iran and Iranian people for the last 30 years. People talk about as if the sanctions just started. That's not true. The sanctions started back in 1979, and in fact, over the past te- three decades, these sanctions not only have hurt uh, ordinary Iranians, but have also consistently helped the hardliners in Tehran to gather more and more power and justify whatever they do under the guise of threat to Iran's national security, uh, sanctions, and military threat. So these sanctions have been counterproductive. They have been in place in decades, although they are tightening them now. They are making it uh, you know, more uh, stronger and um, more difficult to, to handle. But these sanctions have always existed in Iran for the past 30 years. And the most important reason, in my view, is that the, uh, the American government, the, uh, the U.S. administration, do not want to see a country in the Middle East that is politically independent of Washington and does not carry water for them in that region. That's the most important reason. So even if, let's say, tomorrow we wake up and we have uh, a totally new administration, a, new, a totally new government in Iraq, which is totally democratic, but is not a sort of puppet of the United States, the United States will still treat it the way it is treating the Iranian government today. We have to remember, for example, when it comes to Iran's nuclear program, moderates, reformists, and the green movement and the democratic movement, they all support Iran's Iran's nuclear program. It is not as if, if, for example, the opposition leader Mousavi comes to power tomorrow, he is going to stop everything regarding Iran's nuclear program. No. They don't. They support this program because they consider it as Iran's national right. The only difference between them and Ahmadinejad would be that they would set aside Ahmadinejad's rhetoric regarding various issues, for example, Israel and Holocaust and so on, and try to uh, reach some sort of accommodation with the International Atomic Energy Agency away from rhetoric and away from from, uh, slogans and so on. That would be the only difference. Otherwise, they support Iran's nuclear program so long as it is in the framework of Iran's uh, its recognized uh, uh, rights under nuclear non proliferation treaty and safeguard agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency. So that's, that's the root cause of all this hostility towards Iran. They don't want to see an independent Iran making decisions for itself in Tehran and not in Washington. I'm Scott Horton. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm talking with Professor Mohammed Sahimi from the University of Southern California. He writes for AntiWar.com at original.antiwar.com slash Sahimi. And, uh, well, there's all kinds of different directions we can go with this conversation. Uh, well, here's, here's where I want to go with this now, Mohammed. Uh, it seems like more and more smart people that I respect say that uh, Obama, but most importantly, I guess, never mind him, is uh, the opinion of the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of the Navy, the uh, and the Army and the Marine Corps, too. Uh, they don't want war with Iran. They've already decided they don't want war with Iran. They're already looking at, um, you know, a way to, if I mean, obviously the military guys can't exactly make the deal, uh, you know, to avoid whatever progress is made with the nuclear program. But they're basically... Eh, they don't want war, is what I'm trying to say. That's what everybody keeps saying. It's not George Bush and Dick Cheney anymore, thank goodness. Joe Biden is bad enough, but he's not that stupid. So the question now seems to be, according to Paul Rogers at the Oxford Institute, for example, uh, Philip Giraldi uh, on this show in the past and, and in writing at antiwar.com, as well as uh, quite a few others, Gareth Porter, I know, uh, the concern seems to be maybe Netanyahu will go ahead and start the war. 
And maybe Netanyahu will just say to Obama, look, you have to fight now. They're sinking your ships. And, you know, in fact, even if we go back to 2007, Dick Cheney and David Wormser went around deliberately leaking a plan to end run George W. Bush and, and for Cheney and his neocons to make a deal with the Israelis to go ahead and start the war and force George Bush into it. And uh, I guess the same question is, um, you know, still floating around, only now instead of having Ehud Olmert in there, we got Benjamin Netanyahu in there. And I guess the question is, do you think that Netanyahu's got the insanity or the courage or <laughs> however one might spin it to go ahead and do something crazy like start bombing the heck out of Iran in order to drag America into a war? Well, when it comes to Benjamin Netanyahu, Anything is possible. I don't think he and his government are rational people. I think they view the world in a very extreme, narrow, uh, narrow way. And, and uh, in fact, what you uh, express is the fear of many people like myself. Uh, I agree that many people in the United States, prominent people, uh, whether they are politicians or military leaders, don't want a military confrontation with Iran. But the fear of people like me is that Israel will attack Iran, and because it cannot handle a war within Iran by itself, it will drag the United States into this conflict. And if that happens, then the war will spread quickly to the entire region in the Middle East, because Iranians will respond. Iranians will not be like Iraq. No matter how much uh, you bomb Iran, one bombs Iran, they can respond because they have uh, assets, they have possibilities all over this uh, all over the uh, the Middle East and that would be a catastrophic war both for Iran and the Middle East as well as the West and the United States that's our greatest fear and but I should point out one thing uh, President Obama met with Netanyahu a couple of weeks ago and at the end of their meeting he said that well the United States recognizes that Israel and Israel alone can decide what the requirement for its security are, uh, or, or words to that effect. In other words, basically the president gave Netanyahu uh, a go-ahead to do whatever it wants. Well, when you give a, an extremist radical uh, leader like Netanyahu a green light to do what, what he wants, then uh, you should also be prepared uh, for whatever he may do. Uh, he, he, uh, he may do, and, and there have been all sorts of reports about how Israel is uh, preparing attacks uh, against Iran from, for example, Republic of Azerbaijan in northwestern Iran, or you have to also remember that Israel has a very strong presence in the uh, Iraqi Kurdistan part. Israel and Kurdish people in Iraq have had a long-term relationship going back several decades, and Israel has also sent its uh, nuclear submarines to vicinity of Iran. So there have also been all sorts of maneuvers and reports that Israel is uh, preparing to attack, to attack you on. So well, and you know, it's just like the run-up to the Iraq War, too, where it's years and years in the making. You know, there was exactly. a, Ron Paul gave a great speech back in 1998 saying, this is the path to war. We've got to stop this, you know. And, you know, you talk about these sanctions. I don't know how much you know about them or how comparable they are to the sanctions against Iraq, Mohammed, but... The sanctions against Iraq killed a million people. It took an advanced oil-dependent economy that their entire population, their entire division of labor, their entire uh, system of food production and distribution uh, and, and importation was all based on oil money, and they just strangled them. And it was a genocide. And I don't know whether, I guess Russia and China have insisted and made sure that these sanctions against Iran have bigger um, exceptions to them. But if, if these new sanctions amount to anything like the sanctions against Iraq, we're talking about a blockade, which under the laws of nations is an act of war. We're talking about America using terrorists to blow up mosques full of people. At the same time, we're laying a blockade on them. And then, you know... I don't know. Say whatever you want about that. And then also, but please elaborate about what kind of things Iran could do to American interests in the region over the long term. Because after all, it would be an asymmetric war that, you know, they don't have the kind of firepower that America has to bring to bear in any set battle. But then again, they can always avoid set battles, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, the head of Iran's Revolutionary Guard, uh, 
Major General Muhammad Ali Jaffari, uh, who's a uh, hardliner, he's an expert on asymmetric war. In fact, when he was appointed in September of 2007 as the overall commander of the Revolutionary Guard, and uh, Pentagon uh, sources described him as Iran's uh, equivalent of General David Petfield. So that's, that goes to show the level of respect that they have for the guy. And the guy, as I said, is an expert on asymmetric war. If a war breaks out in Iran, uh, first of all, Iranian agents and forces and their allies in Iraq will attack US, remaining, U, uh, remaining U.S. forces in Iraq uh, who are uh, now in much weaker uh, and more vulnerable position than they were like a few years ago. Secondly, Iran has major allies in Afghanistan, which will make life uh, very hellish for NATO forces in Afghanistan. Iran no, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but specify who are Iran's allies in Afghanistan, because this is, of course, part of the smear coming out of the WikiLeaks uh, dump from the other day. Well, the group that overthrew Taliban in Afghanistan, that inter Kabul in Afghanistan, were the, was the Northern Alliance that had been supported and funded by Iran for many years. At the same time, uh, a faction of the conservative groups in Afghanistan, led by Golbadin Hekmatyar, who lived in Iran for several years, uh, is very uh, active in Afghanistan. And in any possible war between Iran and the United States, that group, I am sure, will support uh, Iran and will carry out operations against NATO forces uh, on behalf of Iran. So Iran already has very significant presence in Afghanistan. Well, let me make sure I understand you right. I, I heard you... Uh, certainly about Hekmatyar, um, but did you say that they supported the Taliban or they supported the Northern Alliance types that fought the Taliban? No, no, no. no. There, there, there are two groups. The Northern, the Northern Alliance was against Taliban, right? But they, they are, they are still there, and they have certain differences with Hamid Karzai. The Gorbatin Hekmatyar is, uh, is a sort of fundamentalist Islamic group, not of the Taliban type, but they are fundamentalist group. But they, they were also in alliance with Iran during the so, uh, Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And after Taliban took over Afghanistan in 19, uh, 1996, Hekmatyar moved to Iran and lived in Iran and then went back to Afghanistan when Taliban was removed. But mm. now Hekmatyar is part of the uh, opposition in Afghanistan against uh, uh, Hamid, Hamid Karzai. Although, is it okay if I keep you till the bottom of the hour here? Oh, that, that would be fun. That would be fun. Okay, uh, great. I'm talking with Mohammed Sahimi, professor at USC and writer for PBS and for Antiwar.com, original.antiwar.com slash Sahimi. And we get back, we'll talk more about Iran and Afghanistan and America and Iran after this. Listen to LRN.FM on any phone, anytime, 760-569-7753. That's 760-569-7753. All right, y'all, welcome back to the show. It's Anti-War Radio. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Mohammed Sahimi. Original.antiwar.com slash Sahimi. He's a professor of chemical engineering at USC and an expert, obviously, on Iranian foreign policy issues. And now I think we I had like three outstanding questions and kept interrupting you to go off on tangents here, Mohammed. So in the last 10 minutes, I'm just going to try to be quiet and let you wrap up. The subjects were the new sanctions, how bad they really are, whether they amount to a real path to warfare here or, or already a declaration of war under the old international law anyway, um, how the Iranians might be able to fight back against us. And then at this point, I'd interrupted you to ask you more specific questions about um, Iran's influence in Afghanistan. I, I, I think hopefully people are familiar with the fact that the Iranian government almost invaded Afghanistan to regime change the Taliban themselves in 1998, when I think a dozen uh, Iranian diplomats were executed by the Talibs, and they had a very bad relationship. They helped America there. Uh, Ahmadinejad was in Kabul uh, shaking hands with the mayor of Kabul, or maybe now just the mayor of his palace, Hamid Karzai, uh, a few weeks back. 
but also the WikiLeaks document dump and the, at least the spin. I haven't been able to read through all the documents yet or anything, but at least the spin in the New York Times is, ah, Iranian influence and support for, I, I guess they don't even really say, but the implication is support for the Taliban resistance to America in Afghanistan. So I was hoping that you could address the truth or lack thereof on that point. Well, first of all, uh, Taliban uh, have been a uh, bloody enemy of, uh, of, uh, of Iran in particular and Shiite in, in general. Uh, Taliban are fundamentally Sunni group uh, who even do not consider Shiites as true Muslims. And as you pointed out, in 1998, when Taliban was in power, uh, they killed nine Iranian diplomats. Uh, because of which Iran almost invaded Afghanistan. So there is no truth to Iran and Taliban actually uh, having close relationship or, co- or, or cooperating. But having said that, it would be unwise for Iran not to have some sort of contingency plan in place in Afghanistan so that in case it is uh, attacked by the United States, uh, it can uh, stir up trouble for NATO forces in Iran. Uh, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and as I pointed out before the break, uh, Iran already has allies within, uh, within Afghanistan. Uh, one, one group was the Northern Alliance that was allied in Iran during the Taliban power, and it was basically the group that entered Kabul and overthrew Taliban. And there is also a, a, a Sunni group uh, led by Golbuddin Hekmatyar, who was one of the Mujahideen during the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and was supported uh, by Iran. And when... Uh, Taliban came to power, Hekmatyar moved to Iran and lived in Iran for several years, and he went back to Afghanistan um, uh, uh, after Taliban uh, were overthrown. Now, um, the group led by Hekmatyar is one of the groups that Afghanistan President Hamid Karzai has been trying to negotiate with in order to uh, bring more, uh, more uh, fundamentalist group into his government and make it uh, you know, sort of a broader uh, base. Uh, government in Afghanistan, so that uh, hopefully peace will prevail in Afghanistan. But these these are these are allies uh, of Iran, and in case the United States attacks Iran, I'm sure that those groups uh, will support Iran in, in in any sort of plan that Iran may have. At the same time, we know that the Shiites in in uh, that are in power in Iraq are all allies of Iran. After all, they lived in Iran for. Over a decade, they were trained, funded, and supported by Iran. Mm. And when the United States invaded Iraq, they came to power. And, and all these important Shia groups have very close ties in Iran. In fact, Mokhtato al-Sat, who is an Iraqi nationalist and a Shia, he lives in Iran. He, he doesn't even live in, in, in Iraq. So in case Iran is attacked by the United States, Iranian allies, uh, and in addition to Iranian agents themselves, there are many, many reports, uh, and I have very good first-hand information about uh, thousands of Iranian agents that have uh, moved to, to Iraq uh, and waiting for, uh, for the time if the United States attacks Iran. You have to remember there was a large uh, Shia population from Iraq that moved to Iran during Iran-Iraq war and afterwards because the regime of Saddam Hussein was pressing uh, Iraqi Shiites, and a large number of them moved to Iran, and they lived in Iran for years, and after Saddam Hussein was overthrown, uh, they moved back to Iraq. So, well, let me so, ask you this. The, yes. the Badr Brigade, the, the Badr Corps of the yes. Supreme Islamic Council, now the Supreme Islamic Council apparently has lost a lot of influence since the death of the father, Abdulaziz al-Hakim, and his son taking over. It seems like, um, you know, inside the Iraqi National Alliance now, Sadr is, is uh, by far dominant over them, at least in terms of numbers. But they were the core of the Iraqi army anyway. I wonder if you know whether the Iraqi army now, whether most of the officers and so forth, are they not people from... I mean, specifically the, the people running the Iraqi army. Are they not the Badr Brigade? Oh, yeah, of course, because, in fact, one of the grievances of the, Shi- uh, of the Sunnis in Iraq against the Shiite government was the fact that they purged all the important Sunni officers from the Iraqi army and replaced them by their own people. And many of these people are the same people who were actually trained by Iran during the time when Saddam Hussein was in power. So obviously Iran's uh, loyalists or uh, 
Iran's allies, I should say, exist in, 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 in Iraqi armed forces. And uh, I'm not saying that if uh, the United States attacks Iran, these, the Iraqi army will enter the war. But I'm saying that Iran has a very significant presence in Iraq due to the support that it provided for the opposition to Saddam Hussein for, for over three decades, going back to before the Iranian Revolution. So if Iran is attacked by the United States, all these forces, or at least some of them, will become active and will take actions against U.S. forces in Iraq. And these are just two examples. Iran can attack uh, shipping lanes in the Persian Gulf that carry 70% of the oil that reaches uh, uh, from Persian Gulf uh, to the, to the uh, international market. Iran has, uh, of course, a strong alliance with Hezbollah in, in Lebanon, and Hezbollah is obviously a very uh, powerful military force in southern Lebanon. Um, the majority of population in Bahrain, where the headquarters of U.S. 5th Fleet uh, is located, are Shiites. Uh, Bahrain is uh, ruled by the Sunni minority, but the population is Shiites. And in fact, before, uh, in, the, in the 1960s, Iran always claimed Bahrain as one of its uh, provinces. Um, 45% of Kuwait populations are Shiite. Uh, Saudi Arabia has a very significant Shia minority, about 10 to 15%, most of whom live in eastern uh, Saudi Arabia, where all the major oil fields are. Yeah, so uh, we can definitely see why the military doesn't want to do this. Remember Gareth Porter wrote that thing a couple of years ago now about... Um, Actually, it was something that originally turned up in the Washington Post about escalation dominance. The military doesn't want to get in any fight where they don't think that they can dominate every decision and every escalation and every direction that the fight goes, and that they don't believe that they can have that against Iran. And so, all right, bumper music's explain we got to go, but I think it's worth pointing out here that um, so the Americans don't want to do it except for the war party the Israel lobby, and the neoconservatives, and the government of Israel. And that's why this remains a danger, despite, uh, well, and that's why we have to keep arguing about it. That's why we have to keep contradicting them, because uh, even though it seems unlikely, it uh, there still is a, a group of people in this country who are pushing hard for it and trying to, uh, you know, normalize the discussion of the... Uh, consensus that something must be done and Iran must be bombed eventually and so forth and it will be a disaster and so anyway just thank you Mohammed for your time on the show and and all your time uh, working on this issue and writing the articles you write they're extremely useful and uh, thanks again thank you for having me in your program again Scott all right everybody that is Mohammed Sahimi professor of chemical engineering at USC and we'll be right back